One of the most interesting aspects I found while doing our series on rebuilding humanity's technologies is what a Pandora's box the invention of agriculture was. On the one hand, it opened the door for humanity to build cities and specialize in new trades, which gave birth to innovations like written language and the wheel, which continue to develop into the technologies we use today. But with it, the agricultural revolution greatly reduced the quality of life for your average person. And specifically in one area where this change greatly amplified things, disease and pestilence. So in this video, we're assembling a variety of tools and remedies that have been used by doctors since ancient times. Some are based on faulty medical theories, while others are even still used today. With them, I'm going to test the medical knowledge of Bill Gates, someone who has been deeply involved in the medical world, and see how well he knows his medicine. Around 1200 years ago, humanity started the switch to agriculture. The world population began to take off. And with more and more humans living in close proximity, and now with domesticated animals, infectious diseases became much more common. With the earliest recorded plague as early as 1350 BC, periodic epidemics and pandemics have swiped through various civilizations pretty regularly, any large spread of illness often being labeled under the broad term of the plague. Today, only a handful of them were likely caused by what was now defined by the diseases caused by the bacterium Yersinia pestis. Medical history is full of questionable beliefs and theories, oftentimes mixing in a lot of mysticism and pseudoscience at various points in history. However, there are also long histories of effective treatments being discovered and passed on. Trying to decipher effective medical treatments through all of this can be difficult, even today. Let's take a look at a few famous theories and remedies. The first part of our doctor kit is going to be the plague mask. I'm gonna be using some leather and some thinner leather to stitch it all together. Hopefully it works. These masks started showing up as early as 1619 in Europe as a form of protection for doctors from the plague victims they were treating. While the mask was a later invention of the Middle Ages, the theory it's based off of actually dates back further to the ancient Greek in the 4th century BC with Hippocrates himself. In order to make sure the plague doesn't seep in through the eye holes, I cut them to size of these glass lenses from the glasses episode. This miasma theory proposed that diseases were caused by the bad air of rotting or decomposing material, identifiable by its foul smell. As protection against this bad air, a mask would be worn with a beak filled with aromatic flowers and herbs that was supposed to keep out the infectious air. This theory would continue to remain popular until eventually replaced by germ theory in the late 1800s. Ooh. So I'm gonna forge a few different medieval medical instruments. The first one is called a fleam, and a fleam is a tool that was used for bloodletting, which uh, is kind of key-shaped and has a little blade that comes down. Put on somebody's arm and give it a whack with a mallet, blood would flow out and you would alleviate people of excess blood. Some of the later, more advanced ones are almost like a pocket knife where it folds back into itself and they would have uh, three different blades of various sizes for different purposes. Children, adults, and animals. But we're gonna make a little bit older one. It's a little bit simpler, just one blade. We're gonna forge it out of the stock. Let's give it a shot. Bloodletting dates back even further to as early as the ancient Egyptians. It's based on humoral theory that the human body is made up of four bodily fluids, blood, phlegm, yellow bile, and black bile and the diseases are caused by an imbalance of one of these four liquids. Bloodletting remained popular in Europe up to the 19th century and was thought to be an effective treatment for everything from the plague to smallpox, epilepsy, and gout. In addition to the fleam, I also forged a surgical lance or scalpel, which was also commonly used for bloodletting. After over 2,000 years of popular usage, bloodletting was eventually accepted as being ineffective for most treatments. However, it still remains as an effective option for a handful of medical conditions, such as hemochromatosis. Now onto the herbs. But first I enlisted the help of a glass blower, Mackenzie, for some help in making some glass jars to hold all of them.
now onto the herbs. Over the past few years, I've managed to inadvertently grow and collect a variety of herbs, in addition to a few I intend to collect and harvest in the future. First up, willow bark. Like many of these, its usage dates as early as ancient Egypt and Greece, and was believed to be a treatment for back and joint pain, amongst a variety of other ailments. In 1899, aspirin was famously derived from a precursor found in willow tree bark, and is used to reduce pain, fever, and inflammation. Next is garlic. Similarly, garlic was loved by the ancient Egyptians and Greeks and was considered to be effectively a cure-all for a long list of ailments such as arthritis, cough, and allergies. It's still commonly believed by many to have health benefits today, but there's no real solid evidence that conclusively proves that. Another plant that I've grown myself is the poppy. Ancient Sumerians and ancient Greeks recognized the latex of the poppy flower as having value for cough suppressant and as an anesthetic, and has been used throughout history for this purpose. From the opium latex, morphine was first extracted in 1804, and then heroin was synthesized from morphine in 1874. In the 1900s, various other opioids such as oxycodone were synthesized and remain in use today. Another ancient Greek medicine was stinging nettles. Like many of these, its usage dates as early as ancient Egypt and Greece, thought to be able to treat things like asthma and pleurisy. However, there is no strong evidence to support this. Dating similarly long back to ancient China is the evergreen shrub ephedra, used as a treatment for decongestant and asthma. First isolated in 1885, the ephedra plant contains a mixture of both ephedrine and pseudephedrine. Dating as early as the first century in Greece, milk thistle was thought to treat liver disorders and gallbladder problems. But there has been no strong evidence to support its medicinal use. Used as early as 1500 BC, autumn crocus is believed to be an effective anti-inflammatory. In 1820, colchicine was isolated from the flower and is used as an anti-inflammatory treatment for gout. The leaves of the foxglove plant were used for treatment of heart failure and arrhythmia as early as the 13th century in Europe. In 1930, digoxin was isolated from the plant and is used to treat various heart conditions. Echinacea is a very popular herbal remedy believed to have been used by North American indigenous people as an antiseptic and to fight colds and infections. However, many studies have yielded inconclusive results on its effectiveness. Next, cinchona. Used by pre-Columbian South American cultures, it was known to work as a muscle relaxant and to treat fevers and shivering. In the 17th century, Europeans discovered its effective use against malaria. In 1807, in an attempt to explain how cinchona cured malaria because it was bitter, homeopathic theory was invented, based on the idea of like cures like and a law of minimum dose. One common remedy was called rust toxicodendron, which is made from a piece of poison ivy, which is then diluted in water or alcohol. The solution is then diluted again and again and again until barely a trace of the original poison ivy remains. This remedy would then supposedly treat cramps, sprains, and even the flu. However, there is no evidence of any effectiveness, and homeopathic theory has long been disproven as a pseudoscience. Lastly, we just need to make a medical bag to hold all of our tools and medicine. For the thread, I'm gonna use this. I made it from a deer hide. Just cut thin strips. We're gonna poke it through using the awl and stitch it up, boop. Let's load everything up and see if Bill can tell which of these medicines and treatments are legitimate. On our channel, we kind of like to explore history by going hands-on and kind of building things ourselves. And we've kind of worked our way through history up to the medieval era. We put together a bit of a doctor's kit of various tools and remedies that were used, some dating back as far as ancient Egypt and some a little bit newer. And I heard you're, you're a little bit of a, a medical and history nerd. I wanted to kind of challenge you with uh, picking out of these, roughly half of them are actually used today as an FDA approved drug. So the other ones don't have any real conclusive evidence. So I'm curious if you know which ones are which. Echinacea? Mm, probably not. Correct. <laughs> you got one so far. 
<laughs> Chicharron the bark. That's like super famous because it's weird. It grows only on trees high up in South America, but it's the source for quinine, which was the only drug for treating malaria. Even today, like chloroquine is a derivative of the original quinine. Good job. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know how to say this one, so I'm going to give it to Andy. It's Ras Taxa Dendolrong. Don't know that one, so I'll say no. Yeah, You're right. It's a homeopathic remedy. Poppy. Well, I think painkiller stuff is derived from poppy seed. That is correct. <laughs> and also, you know, opioid drugs that aren't good for you, so a mix of good and bad there. We were a little worried to bring this on the plane. Yeah. <laughs> Garlic, and then flower called autumn crocus. Garlic, I think, was to get rid of vampires or something, but I don't think the FDA had that as a, They're not uh, an vampires. approved condition. Uh, That's true. I've never heard of that. It's a nice, colorful thing, but I don't know what it is. And that is an actual drug. Oh, really? Yeah. What for? It's a uh, treatment for gout. Oh, oh I never had right. gout, so. <laughs> <laughs> That's good, but I will study that one. All right, got two more. We got foxglove and milk sisal? Not milk sisal. This relaxes your heart muscle, yeah. uh, and it's actually just exactly the drug mm -hmm. comes straight out of there. Yeah, you you know your drugs. <laughs> stinging nettles and willow bark. It's weird, I mean, stinging nettles might distract you from <laughs> something else. Willow bark, it's actually not aspirin, but it's a chemical relative. But I think that is the first natural painkiller. Yep. Correct. And we have ephedra. Well, ephedra, yeah. That's pretty easy because the drug is ephedrine. Well, the most famous, I think, is the bark. Yeah. I think the second most famous you didn't have, which is the artemisinin, which is a Chinese remedy for malaria. It's artemisina is the plant. And now it's the most, by far, the biggest malaria drug in the world. And it was during the Vietnam War that finally somebody said, oh my God, we need to get this. And then they realized the trees actually grew outside the NIH building that they worked in. There were Artemis in the trees anyway. So uh, it's, it's weird how, where medicines come from. Yeah, I think you pretty much got all of them. You got a lot more right than I expected. <laughs> yeah, I'm impressed. This is our plague mask that I made. There's plague where the flea bites you. And then there's mnemonic plague that was airborne. So that probably did work for the mnemonic form of the plague, which is the worst when it would get into that form would be super bad. But I think the way it spread around was mostly the one where the rats get bitten by fleas that bite humans. Plague is weird and it still shows up every once in a while. Yeah, I hope I don't have to wear this someday, but <laughs> I have this one that I made if I need to. There's two times that mask were invented. Once there was in Asia, bubonic plague, and they didn't use that, I don't think. But, uh, and then of course the 1918 flu, some people realized we should do masks, which it was so weird, you know, why did it take four or five months before people said, okay, masks should be worn by everyone? Uh, because they had known that back in 1918 anyway. We were confused. But yeah, they're always trying to look at the old traditional stuff and see is there some crazy thing yeah. that we, we missed. And the fact that some of it was legitimate. Yeah. Uh, when they finally looked at Chinese medicines, it turned out there was arsenic in a lot of them. And arsenic, because it's a poison, there's some way that if you take it exactly the right amount, mm -hmm. it actually is beneficial. Oh. Mm -hmm. But if you take too much, that then it's <laughs> super bad for you. Well, we are set for the next <laughs> pandemic with all of these. Maybe not these so much. <laughs> how did you learn so much about pandemics? And how did you kind of become to be one of the leading experts on it? Well, my foundation has a lot of really deep experts. I mean, people who've been involved in making lots of vaccines. We hired people, you know, who've been out in the field working on diseases, people who work for pharmaceutical companies. You know, there's those great books about these disease guys who figure out, okay, was it the parrot oh, that sure. got everybody yeah. sick or was it yeah. the funny glue that they were using? And so I'd say collectively, that group during the pandemic, we had these weekly meetings and we always have innovation on our side. I mean, you know, say this pandemic had come 20 years ago, we couldn't have done remote work because the yeah. internet capacity wasn't there. Mm -hmm. And the only vaccines we would have gotten were uh, what are called inactivated, that were not nearly as good as all the other types of vaccines. So thank goodness, you know, it didn't come sooner. Now, if it comes 10 years from now and, you know, people read the book and do the right things, then it will be, we'll nip it in the bud. Is the, and so we won't even use the word pandemic. We'll just say it was an outbreak and we jumped in like, uh, they show in the movies. Uh, that yeah, it can, it can be happening, yeah. 
Well, speaking of that, you did predict the pandemic. You you tried to warn people, but <laughs> what would you do if you could go back? Would you change your message to get more people to listen, or do you think they would have? It's hard. You know, the views of the video, 90% are after it was too late. Yeah. I'm not sure we could have done much better. If you don't practice, it's hard. And with earthquakes and fires, you have lots of small ones. But in rich countries, we don't have a lot of infectious disease outbreaks. You know, we handle our sanitation really well, our food. Every once in a while, you'll get like listeria, E. coli, salmonella, little outbreaks. We did have Australia in that first 100 days. They said, okay, let's get a lot of diagnostic machines. Then we'll quarantine reasonably effectively everybody who tests positively. And then they cut off a lot of the international travel. And a few other countries that rolled out the diagnostics very quickly. So they'll end up with 10% of the death rate of the United States. And most of the other rich countries are very similar to the US. So that's pretty dramatic. So we do have some positive exemplars to guide us for next time. Kind of living through the pandemic, it felt like a lot of things didn't go right. What are some big things like that were done right and some big things that were done definitely wrong? Well, we really screwed up getting the diagnostics capacity up quickly and then directing it so there was no backlog. I mean, there's nothing stupider than sending in your sample and not getting the result within 24 hours because if it's positive, you know, if you get it back three days later, all you can do is write apology notes uh, to the people you infected. The one that really stands out as amazing is how quickly we developed the vaccines. Mm -hmm. You know, that typically has taken five years. The fact that we did it in less than a year, wow. I mean, that was society, you know, pulling out all stops, going full speed ahead. The vaccines weren't perfect. You know, they didn't block all the infection, but they were extremely good at preventing severe disease and death. You know, and so that saved definitely millions of lives. But I'd say in diagnostics, we were slow. Therapeutics, drugs you take after you get sick, only now where we're more than two years in, are there a couple, Molnupiravir from Merck and Paxlovid from Pfizer that look quite promising. In fact, if you take Paxlovid within like three or four days of getting infected, it looks like that cuts the deaths over 80%. You have to take it early enough. Once you get to the hospital, that one can't, it's too late to help you then. Mm -hmm. We don't have that in our jar, so. <laughs> <laughs> no, those are those are weird synthetic chem antiviral chemicals that okay, nature well, nature <laughs> nature does not uh, dish those things up. Sure. What do we need to learn from this in in order to get like caught up with our medical preparedness? Health in rich countries, it's almost too good, and it makes us not realize that wow, there's still a lot of disease out there, and we should be more generous with both investments and resources resources to help the the poor countries. And so sadly, you know, we, we just weren't ready at all. You know, the 1918 flu, that is, you know, sort of the mega event that you go, wow, why did it happen then? You know, could it ever happen again? And 100 years is so long ago that it's not like everybody remembers it. It's a pretty narrow group of people. I think this is going to be seared into people's memory. I think for a generation, you know, when there's even the slightest sign, we'll be okay, is this one of those? And the right things will happen. Yeah. So misinformation has always been a challenge throughout uh, medical history. There's a lot of just pseudoscience and misinformation that uh, <laughs> lives with us even today. Uh, what are some tools we have to help fight that now? You know, the history of medicine really in terms of meaningful interventions, you know, only starts happening in the 1800s. I mean, we didn't understand blood. We didn't have doing things where we would kill the germs. And so in the 1800s, slowly but surely, medicine really does start to save lives. There was a while there you were better off just giving birth at home versus going into a hospital because a hospital, there was all sorts of germs in the hospital. Yeah. Now medicine is, you know, just incredible what they can do, you know, there's still this idea of, okay, maybe these traditional things people know better. I don't know, always in medicine, people are subject to believing things with very little evidence that uh, they or their friends are connected to. But I have to say during the pandemic, the idea of, you know, saying that masks weren't good or the vaccines overall are this awful thing, that took me by surprise.
surprise. And a little bit, it's, you know, the digital channels played a big role in that, where the truth moved very slowly and was kind of boring. And the, hey, this vaccine is a plot to make money. And, that is uh, more interesting. Uh, yeah, way, <laughs> you know, it gets you emotionally engaged and you click on it. So the idea that, okay, I know something uh, and there's this malfactor that, you know, has some uh, motivation for doing the thing, that really came up a lot more than I expected. You know, we need trusted people from various backgrounds, you know, from your local area, from your religion, you know, somebody you can relate to who clearly kind of studies things. We weren't ready, and so we had fairly big fractures where the U.S. was almost among the worst at all the, the craziness and, you know, moving it into sort of a political realm. Well, we do like excitement. <laughs> <laughs> well, the pandemics are good for that. Uh, <laughs> to kind of advance our knowledge from the medieval era to up about 300 years, I want to invite you to help us discover penicillin. <laughs> so we have here some bread that's been molding. Also fun to travel with on the plane. Should be some penicillin in there. And we have some Petri dishes to collect it on and let it start to grow. And we'll go through a long process to eventually turn into penicillin. Nice. I actually own the Petri dish that Fleming used when he Oh, really? Discovered this, oh, wow. yeah. Another great accidental discovery. I believe it's the green ones that are penicillin. I think you're right. And then put it on. Perfect. Cool. Thank you for your help and for doing this interview with us. No, it's fun, fun. I love science. I love the guys, the way you guys mess around with fun things. Thank I wish you. I'd had, had your channel when I was a kid. Could have been on it then too. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you. All right, yeah. thanks. Thank you to Bill Gates for inviting us to explore some of our medical history, as well as helping us advance our medical knowledge. Be sure to check out his book on his proposal on how we could possibly prevent a pandemic from ever happening again. No small feat. With the penicillin sample he helped us collect, it will now be a little bit of a lengthy process to try and develop that into a, an actual usable quantity, um, but that's gonna take a few months, so be sure to subscribe if you aren't yet, so you don't miss that when it eventually comes out. Ideally, I hope to explore some of the medicinal plants that I wasn't able to grow myself, specifically cinchona, as a very interesting topic. I don't know the timeline on that, but hopefully we can do it sometime in the near future. And if you have any other medicinal plants you want me to explore, leave me a comment. Thanks again for watching. If you enjoyed this video, be sure to subscribe and check out other content we have covering a wide variety of topics. Also, if you've enjoyed these series, consider supporting us on Patreon. We are largely a fan-funded channel and depend on the support of our viewers in order to keep our series going. Thanks for watching.